This is an OGM uh, call, Thursday call, uh, today, uh, July 22nd, 27th, 2023. Jerry is in Geneva uh, doing some facilitation. So we're on a different Zoom. And maybe not uh, everybody will find us. Well, you put it in the right place. <laughs> Not everybody will look. I have to leave after an hour, just in case I disappear. Well, now that's such a small, so I just want to follow up, Stacy, on your little comment about you're happy I'm taking care of myself. The one thing that's really happened, which I was surprised, I basically got on a diet of just reading as many women philosophers, political mm -hmm. theorists, poets, essays, I just basically have stopped reading all this expository material from uh, men. Not that it's bad, but my experience is different. And I'm actually really enjoying the, the, the tone and the kind of different perspective on you know, some of the same issues and you know, and some of the, I'm reading a woman, Martha Nussbaum, who's a philosopher, who's written about emotions, among other things. You know, so she's pretty much a heavyweight in the philosophy world. It's like super, just, you know, so I'm like, yay, yay, yay me. <laughs> Let's read more of that. Uh, do you, uh, can you rattle off a couple more uh, folks we should check out? So I just came across Wendy Brown, who um, has just published her a book that she wrote based on some lectures she gave a couple of years ago called Nihilistic Times. I'll put some references in the chat. And basically, she has been teaching for, you know, a couple of decades, but she talks about in her understanding how to make sense use philosophy and stuff is to read with people so the, apparently there are a couple of lectures that uh, max weber gave towards the end of his life about sciences of vocation and i can't remember the other one offhand and she's been reading these with herself and students and there's a couple of lectures on how actually to read older you know, more established writers read with them and uh, be able to make use of their thinking currently without, you know, getting sidetracked. She was interviewed in a little podcast about this book. And uh, it was interesting, you know, because she said, you know, Labor was quite conservative. He didn't really care about public education. He wasn't interested in any of that. <laughs> On the other hand, <laughs> Yes, some interesting things, generative things to say that are worth, you know, thinking about. Um, and then something that Doug Carmichael, I found in his Garden World book was uh, Margaret Shabas, S-C-H-A-B-A-S, who's an economist who wrote a very, very interesting book that I got secondhand that talks about how this idea we have of the economy, you know, oh, there's, let's talk about the economy. Well, you know, in the beginnings after the enlightenment, when people were trying to understand <laughs> natural <laughs> philosophy, um, there wasn't any kind of an idea, there wasn't a thing called the economy. So it's very interesting about what concepts and categories we've invented. And, you know, so that's some of what I'm getting from the readings. Um, it's a little bit of a critical and, uh, well, for me, a lot of fun. Also educational and, you know, unhook some of those other neuronal, uh, you know, pathways. You know, what? don't think like that anymore, Bill. <laughs> think like this. So. I love that, Bill. What I love the most is what you mentioned about reading together. 
because I think one of the most important aspects of that is when an idea comes out, it doesn't get stopped in one direction by one person because anybody that's there hears it and can take the piece of what they need and carry that idea with them. So in a way, like the problem that we have with time and everybody being at a different point in time or having you know, their history is altered by time, it sort of corrects for that a little bit. I don't know if I'm making the idea clear, but in reading together, it's like hearing a song. Everybody can hear something different and know for themselves which part they need to develop their thoughts. Does that make any sense? <laughs> yes, and I'd like to be in situations where one can like kind of bounce those associations off one another. Right. Yeah, because sometimes I think pretty, you know, I go off on tangents and my wife is kind enough to point out, well, well that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> so it's like, oh well, yeah, you're right you. about that. <laughs> you know, so, but so it's nice actually to, I'm really a kind of a fan of a little bit of free association. Like what is the first thing that comes into your mind, my mind? And sometimes I write it down and sometimes it, you know, seems to be of value to pursue it. Sometimes it's just like, well, you know, that's a good one to just let, just let that idea go. Right. Um, um, so I would, but there's this Wendy Brown book about learning how to read with an already established, you know, like she's reading Max Weber because she thought these lectures just happened to be about his time, but also can be about our time. So, so yes, I guess it's a yes and a yes. <laughs> well, I'm glad it's making you feel good at the very least. Yeah. Uh, welcome folks, uh, you're catching the tail end of a uh, discussion that Stacy and Bill had. Bill was saying how he's enjoyed uh, taking a break from uh, uh, expository material from men, not that it's bad, and uh, going on a diet of uh, reading women philosophers and political uh, theorists. Thanks, Paul. That's a, I, I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, I'll try and put a couple of the, I don't want to run away to my desk and my headset will go, you know, I'll have to kill a Bluetooth programmer, so I don't really want to do that. I'll try and put the stuff in, in the chat. Um, I, I, uh, my plan was not to facilitate or moderate. I can facilitate a tiny bit, but I'm gonna kind of rely on the, the room to um, facilitate y'all self. So um, I've been thinking about how as climate issues uh, become more public and there's a more anxious public discussion, the internet will actually get used a lot more by people to figure out what the heck is going on in their neighborhood or in the world. The result is a shift of the public realm from physical objects in the nation state to a worldwide network which raises all sorts of interesting possibilities of new forms of governance. End of thought. Just a tangent, I read something in the media this morning that if the Republicans gain control, they will dismantle all efforts about climate change. You can't make I could, stuff up. I couldn't. What was that? I said, I just read something in the media this morning that if Republicans regain power of uh, Congress and the presidency, they would dismantle all climate change uh, efforts. Hey, I've kind of seen they're doing a little bit. Uh, I, I I didn't read it, but I saw a headline. Uh, Republicans want to plant one trillion trees. I I think, I don't know. The whole thing is weird. Uh, Stuart, I think you might be on the wrong mic. Okay. It, it sounds like you're boomy and 
distant model. Thank you. I will check. Hmm? I Doug, I really like your your thought, and it feels like something that's kind of been happening for a while. I I think you know physicalness and uh, uh, things like the economy and and uh, political spheres and stuff like that. They're going to continue to have a lot of strength, um, but but a thing that you said that we're getting digit, you know, digital. I, I, the way I kind of ended up hearing it was we have a digital uh, public sphere or something like that. And I was reflecting this morning, I was on Blue Sky. Not everybody's on Blue Sky yet because it's still invite only. But um, there are more and more uh, uh, artists, visual artists, uh, kind of trickling over from from Twitter, and it was it was something that I could kind of reflect on. Um, there was a post. Um, somebody said, uh, "I I I like I'm not a visual artist, but I I love seeing visual art. So I follow a lot of I have followed a lot of artists on Twitter, and now I'm not really on Twitter, and now I'm on Blue Sky and Mastodon. Um, the the whole Twitter thing and Musk and X and all that it's hit artists really hard. Um, a lot of them have built their their business for 10 years, uh, you know, uh, five, 10 years. Um, like everything they do, their whole professional life is based around Twitter. And some of them are now leaving and they're fed up with it and don't want to do the Twitter thing anymore with Mr. Musk. And it's, it's difficult. It's, it's a real, um, you know, uh, it's like getting kicked out of your, uh, your, your office in your home all at once. It's pretty amazing. I um, haven't I haven't been to the even the normal OGM in a couple months, so um, good to see you. Um, not that this isn't a normal OGM; it's just in a different room, <laughs> Jerryless. Um, I was thinking about what what Doug was saying, and uh, and I think. Pete, how you followed it, talking about public sphere. Um, and the kind of obviating of nation states um, toward uh, a sort of um, horizontal um, governance does seem like, uh, I hesitate to use the word market, but you know, sort of a, 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 a force that will, that will, I mean, there, there's some, there's some momentum there that I don't think people will really identify for a while. Um, but building tools to facilitate it, I think is gonna to be tough because I don't think it's gonna happen in, you know, it, it, it necessitates there being things that are not walled gardens um, because, you know, just as governance has sort of, has sort of um, pressed against the borders of nation states, um, digital governance will press against the borders of, of platforms and, and, you know, groupings and how do we permeate those? And it involves, you know, common standards um, and maybe their activity pub, <laughs> but, um, but, but something, you know, in the way that, that email doesn't have, um, you know, corporately bordered, um, well, borders, um, and, and can travel past borders. So figuring out how to do that with digital spaces, I think is the, is the question. And, and 
Love to see us all solve it. Are we just saying what's on our minds? Is I'm not clear what our protocol is today. Dude, seize the power. Okay. <laughs> um, well, it's 101 degrees Fahrenheit off the coast of Florida in the ocean. And I don't know if people saw yesterday, you know, nature put out a paper saying the uh, Gulf Stream current, which is part of the entire ocean conveyor current, could collapse anytime between 2025 and 2095, um, with an estimate of 2050. And that'll have really severe repercussions around the world because uh, it will dramatically change all the, the climate. Uh, there will be no climate stability anywhere. We could have, you know, all kinds of wild shit happening. So I, I'm just finding the the climate news, which has been in the background for a long time, is is now foreground in a way that's really frightening and you know i'm seeing some headlines but i'm not hearing a lot of people talk about it and um I, i'm just it's that's just what's present for me right now is is how to be how to sit here and enjoy my life which is really good you know i'm personally i'm doing well i'm i'm i'm, I'm okay but i look at what's happening on the planet with increasing horror and um and i don't want to act out of just sense of urgency you know we need to be thoughtful about this but i'm not seeing uh i'm looking at the politics and the leadership that's occurring and i'm just not seeing what uh what i would expect humanity to come up with in order to survive so um, i'm having a a moment where the horizon is closing in and rapidly in a very dark and dangerous way and uh, that's what's up with me Yeah, I'll 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 pick up briefly on that, and I hope my mic is adjusted now. Um, Much better. And it's amazing that um, few, if any, quote leaders <laughs> are responding to that scientific news, um, and so. You know, I have the same reaction, Ken, uh, you know, underneath, um, you know, having been aware for such a long time. Um, and I guess maybe even a little guilt for not taking um, more of an activist role, uh, you know, in, in, in all of this. Um, but in terms of governmental response, I mean, it's just so congruent with the notion that they're not doing anything, that that you know that there's no political will there to to take action. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of to validate that. I laugh sometimes because uh, um, it, it, it's it's almost easier to do that than to cry. We don't have any plan for what we would want leadership to actually do. You say shift from will to action, but what action? There's nothing they can think of to do that makes any sense. I just got back from a couple of months in the Balkans uh, talking to people there. And what struck me was not quite a consensus, but in that direction, that uh, People are saying, uh, look, it's all going to fall apart, but don't try and change it now because you'll make it fall apart faster. And Doug, is there any sense of um, 
quote, planning for when things do fall apart? Uh, no. And part of it is, of course, that one can't put a uh, time on when things fall apart. So it's hard to do a plan. Yeah. I know in my own personal life, <laughs> you know, where I go is to wonder, am I going to be still alive and, and tilting at windmills, you know, when things fall apart or not? You know, and sometimes I wish, well, perhaps I'll die first. And sometimes I wish I'm here ready to serve when things do break down. So to jump ahead a little, um, my emotional reaction to all this was to paint a painting, which made me feel good. But the painting is terrible. It shows a big red brick building with a large entranceway and a long line of people lined up to go in that entrance. And there's a sign outside that says, waiting 15 minutes. The building has a big bronze plaque, which says what the building is, Federal Suicide Center. Well, I, I came in late, but I get the mood. Um, I came in the middle of Ken or late in Ken share. I didn't know if we were talking about climate or fascism or what, but there are certain, certainly plenty to choose from. Um, um, I don't know if people follow Tom Hartman, uh, but he had a post this morning weaving together the stories of the um, the, AM, the possible collapse of the AMOC um, and then connecting that with the clathrate hypothesis, what's being called the clathrate gun, which is a speculation about the uh, rapid release of methane uh, stores from the seafloor, um, which then, you know, uh, th this, what I got from it on a very quick scan this morning is a reminder that climate destabilization is not a linear process. Um, and there can be a cascade of things that moves extremely quickly, um, you know, not at the scale of geologic time, but political time or personal time. And um, uh, my immediate reaction, and Stuart, kind of with reference to what you said, I, you know, I've been, I, I have been an activist on this for a long time. Um, um, and um, and have not been a prepper, you know, certainly not a, you know, not an extinction. It's, it's all doom. Let's give up and prep. But, uh, and I've had some of the sentiment that you talked about of, um, I don't know why my camera's not working, but anyway, um, of, um, you know, I'm not going to be alive to see the worst of it. <clears throat> um, but I have people I love who are young, you know, and who will, uh, but my reaction this morning was um, very personal of, you know, my wife and I may not be alive to see the worst of it, but we may be alive to see some of it and we're not prepared. Um, whether it's, uh, you know, I mean, the fires we've been living with, whether it's uh, water availability or food supplies uh, or financial collapse, all those other measures. And so, and sort of, you know, I woke up this morning into in addition to the activism, which I will not stop until they carry me out of your feet first, um, it's time for some personal care and some personal planning. Um, that said, I want to um, I want to comment, Doug, on Doug C, on what you said. Um, <clears throat> you and I have batted back and forth about this a few times, but uh, what I'm what I'm observing today is that you are you may be asking the wrong question, or not the most powerful or interesting questions. Um, you 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 often say that nobody's planning, that there are no plans, 
Um, and from my perspective, there are a lot of people planning and there are a lot of plans. I mean, Amory Lovins has been issuing plans for 50 years. Some of them have been taken up, some of them have, have not. We are, we are awash in plans. What we are not awash in is effective implementation of those plans or the power to compel those plans to be implemented. And uh, you know, if the political landscape turns wrong, even less possibility there. So I think the question is not, what are the plans, but how do we get the plans moved into action um, <clears throat> when we're in the grips of a fossil industry that is committed to riding, you know, to, to profiting as much as possible as we ride the slide down to destruction. Um, uh, you know, so the plans that we need are not just um, energy transition and industrial transformation and perhaps, you know, economic and societal transformation and so forth, but how do we get those into motion? How do we effectively organize um, the political and cultural forces to move plans forward? And I think it's a very different question and to, to my perspective, a more fruitful one right now. Uh, you know, we, we, in addition to all the climate plannings, we sure as hell better win the next election in this country. Are, you know, what are the plans to do that? Are they good enough? Are they effective? Are they likely to work? What are we doing to do that? Uh, are we mobilized? Somebody posted a, 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 a pie diagram yesterday that basically was like, uh, I forget the numbers exactly, but it was like, you know, 81 million votes for Biden and 79 million votes for Trump and 111 million votes that nobody voted. So I'm interested in a plan for getting, you know, 10 or 20 million of those people voting and voting Democrat so that we don't flip into a fascist United States in 17 months or whatever the count is. Anyway, I'm, I'm done for the moment. So this might turn out to be my most uncomfortable moment ever in these Zoom calls, but I'm going to go for it, especially because of how Bill started out talking about how he was reading all these female voices. Um, in Gil, did you want to? Okay. In being on a lot of these calls, and in particular, um, some other calls, one of the things that I want to point out is that when I see a lot of men who are getting together with solutions. The one thing that I notice is when there's a disagreement, rather than trying to take the person's idea and assess whether or not it would stop other people's progress, in which case I could see pushing back on it, they usually fight and try to, really, it's sort of like the person has to defend their ideas in a way that's not necessarily constructive, in a way that's not designed to help it make, to help make it fit into other people's plans so that there can be coordination. It's usually done in a way to shut down that person's ideas. And I think that the reason I'm saying it, even though this is really uncomfortable, I don't know if you could see my voice, you know, hear my voice shaking, but it will be so important for many of you to start listening to some of these people that are working on ideas that you like their ideas, but there's something you don't like. And what I suggest is if you have a way that you think you can make them better, go for it and say it. Say, maybe that would work if, if we do this. And that's a, a new way to explore thought. But to just shut the person down and keep telling them why it won't work when you don't have an alternative is really not helpful. And I hope some of you will hear that. And thank you. Mike, go ahead. There's no moderator. <laughs> well, I don't know if we're still doing the 20 seconds of contemplation so that we all let it sink in. Um, I, I, I think you said about five different things that I wanted to sink in. 
particularly about hearing different voices, not just non-male voices, but non uh, upper middle class, upper class American viewpoints. Um, I, I went to MIT for grad school and uh, when people from other universities came to give presentations, uh, often because they were being considered for a, a job at, at MIT, it was like gladiatorial combat. You know, people came in and, you know, almost from the first three minutes after they presented their overall thesis and their technique, people were jumping on them and attacking it. And I, I, I think, I, I think that uh, can be very healthy if you have colliding ideas, both of which are somewhat wrong, that leads to a third idea that might be more right. But the emotional costs of doing that are, are often uh, pretty high and not, uh, not acknowledged. A, a friend of mine, John Wolpert, W-O-L-P-E-R-T, uh, who I worked with when I was at IBM, is coming out with a book in a few weeks called The Two But Rule. And the, the basic thesis is that most conversations are but conversations, B-U-T. Somebody says something and someone says, but, but you know, of course, that won't work. And his thesis is that you do have to say that. You have to say, but that's not the best way to do it, or but that's not going to work. And then you immediately follow it with what you said. But let's explore why you want to do that and how we can do it better. So I, I, I wholly endorse what you're saying there. Um, I, 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 I worry more right now, though, that we're all in the no but rule. We're not even debating solutions to global warming. We're, we're just, oh, my God, it's terrible. Oh, my God, I'm depressed. Oh, my God, the political system's frozen. And, and and we're just not we're not moving forward as fast as we need to and it is it is clearly clearly crisis mode now thank you oh oh just just one last comment um I was late because we were having our uh Carnegie endowment senior staff meeting we have a whole world of uh of researchers who come together for an hour and 15 minutes every month and our special, one of our special featured researchers who just joined us is named Jamie Kwong, K-W-O-N-G. And she's just done fascinating work on how climate change will affect our nuclear deterrence. So she actually combined two of the overarching themes that people here at Carnegie are working on. And I think it's gonna wake up a lot of people who worry about military issues, because the flooding that's going to make some of our naval stations and our naval submarine bases inoperable, uh, the problems that we might have with some of our, our land-based missiles, which are in floodplains that are being flooded a lot more. I mean, it really was a fascinating conversation. So that that is my hope, is that we're going to start getting everybody to understand how this impacts them and and not just uh, having a lot of stories about people in Somalia who are already living on the edge. Uh, my, my favorite story is how all the wealthy CEOs in the fossil fuel business who live in Texas and go skiing in Colorado are discovering that they're going to need oxygen to get up to the snow because you're not going to have you're going to have ski resorts at 11,000 feet because that's the only place you'll be able to have snow long enough to go skiing. The first thought that leaps to mind about that sadly is that you know for the for the affluent skiers, it'll be, oh great, you know, we have to have expensive equipment now and we'll, you know, um, all banter about what the best one is. 
but it'll be expensive and it'll keep all the riff raff, raff off the ski slopes. So, uh, you know, we'll have it all to ourselves. Sad that that comes to mind. Sad, but true. Hearing a piece the other day about the Highwood strike, and um, you know, there's uh, I posted the gem list if you want to find it. But uh, one of the things the industry is is saying is we want to have um, actors come in for one day, pay them scale, and then we're going to scan them. We're going to have access to that scan for the in perpetuity, and they will get no residuals. It'll be nothing. And the actors like, screw you, man. That's that's going to screw us over. That's totally bullshit. And there's a studio executive who in 2021 was paid $227 million in compensation for the year, telling the people, we can't afford it. The industry's in a downturn. So you have to suck it up and eat, you know, just tough. And uh, some accounting firm did an estimate that said the demands of the actors um, would amount to about um, $650 million per year which is um, what this man has earned in compensation in the last five years. And he's telling people we can't afford it. We can't afford you, we can only afford V. So I'm wondering if we might starting to be get close to a tipping point where people are gonna say, I'm not gonna eat cake. Get your Marie, if you're in a Marie Antoinette costume, expect to lose your head here. Um, we're tired of billionaires telling us what to do. We cannot afford billionaires when people, when the whole planet's burning, it's no time for billionaires. Um, that wasn't actually what I wanted to say, but that's what came up when you talked about the technique. <laughs> what I actually wanted to, to say was, I hear this thing that's been hearing, I've been hearing for a long time, going back to when Reagan was in office, he says, you know, uh, we're going to bomb Russia. It starts in 10 seconds or whatever, right? This idea that if there was a an existential threat from outside of humanity, like aliens, you know, or a meteor, that, that we would actually come together and, and make the changes necessary. And I don't honestly believe that anymore. I used to believe that, but COVID pretty much disabused me of that notion. You know, this was an existential threat and there was a, an industry ready to mobilize people to say, no, that's all bullshit. And the same thing with climate. We have, we have trillion dollar industries who are vested in, we're not going to acknowledge the challenge of climate change. The GOP platform for 2024 calls for rolling back all of the, um, the money that, that was in the inflation reduction act. And yeah, don't look up, go. And um, you know, it's like they want more fossil fuel burning. So I have a question. Maybe some of be somebody in this in this room is smart enough to answer or can can help us think it through of what do you do when when there's all of this misinformation and disinformation that serves those who are benefiting and screws over everybody else, which is ninety nine point ninety nine point ninety nine percent of the planet. Sorry, I didn't need the second decimal point, you know. How how do you um, counter that? What's the Aikido move? You know, I don't want to make others and enemies. When I look at large corporations, I've worked in large corporations. They're not monolithic. There's lots of good people inside of them, but they're inside of an ideology that is actually destroying the basis for our life. You know, it's converting ecosystems into dollars with the terrible results. And so, what's the answer? How do we, you know? How do we work with those people to awaken them, enlighten them? And if they refuse, what's the alternative? You know, they're the ones with their, their hands on the levers of power. How do we get that back? How do we arrest the, the power back so that the people waiting to be born will have a chance to say, we're coming in here and we appreciate the work you're doing as opposed to we're going to curse your name for generations to come. So, um, I did post earlier, um, there's uh, Marjorie Kelly, uh, The Democracy Col um, Collaborative. And first book I had seen of hers was Divine Right of Capital, which mean, which we need to move from the political, er addressing a political aristocracy, which is what our framers tried to do. I mean, people talk about some of the stuff. I mean, 
they try to impose modernism on the founders and stuff. They were trying to break away from the divine right of kings. They wanted to have us, can we have a stable form of government that would uh, would not, it could, um, we could have a peaceful transfer of power. So, I mean, what happened January 6th is about the most fundamental affront you could have to the framers of the Constitution. Um, she's got some amazing other books, and she's got one that's just going to be coming out on wealth supremacy um, and stuff. So, I'd be curious to take a look at that. I mean, with some of the other stuff I've been, I brought it up several times and I've been, I had it pop up on a Facebook memory, like from 2011, I think it was about, um, there's a guy, Peter Elbow, who wrote a, a book or, or uh, an essay about the believing game. And so, so I mean, it's the it kind of gets to some of the things Stacy was talking about um, with another group that, Stacy and Doug B is in, I tried to bring that up as a topic and was looking to connect it to Edward de Bono's six thinking hats, thinking that, um, wanting to make a connection that this believing game is kind of the yellow hat thinking. And so can we, I would, we, we live in the, the science, the hegemony of, science is the black hat and talk about critical thinking it's just tearing things apart um, some of Peter Elbow's things he talks about careful thinking and, and we're missing half the doubting game we're missing half the um, thing so I mean I'd like to be able to see um, I've been trying to see if I can find a group of people who are certified and 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 um, facilitating the six thinking hats method and can we get can we look to engage that because the believing games about seeking validity and things you don't agree with is silly so I guess um to your friend Mike I would um volume volume two is from butt squared to yes I am <laughs> 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 so, I guess I'll leave it there for now. It's blurry, Gil. We couldn't see it. It's, it's for Carl. It's the album for Six Thinking Hats. Yeah. Said I'll, I'll be happy to give to anybody who'd like it. <laughs> Yeah. So I wanted to punctuate what what Stacy said, and it's interesting that I'm I I often find myself the only male in a group of females, and the conversations are very very different. <laughs> There's much more natural collaboration and uh, concern for relationships. Um, just historically, you know, how we've tended to resolve conflict, you know, I, I think, you know, quote, cavemen, you know, would whack each other over the head with a, <laughs> with a, with a tree trunk or whatever, at least how that's how it's depicted, but it's not a bad metaphor. And then, and then, um, there was jousting when people went to court, which was the nobleman's uh, 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 prerogative and the local nobleman saved things. And then, you know, that moved into civil courts, which are not civil at all for dealing with disputes. And then we had this movement called alternative dispute resolution. Um, and I had a laugh once when somebody was advocating for how to be a good mediation advocate, <laughs> which is a, an oxymoron, because if you're an advocate, you're trying to win as opposed to, you know, listen to ideas and, and, and come up with useful solutions. Um, 
1993, I published an article in the San Francisco Bar Journal called um, um, Silver Foxes and the Art of Resolution. And in some ways, it articulated my ideal of some wise lawyers that I saw that were really where, in some ways, we all need to be right now in terms of educating and shifting internal mindsets and systems about how we've been trained to think by the context we live in. And a lot of that is the argumentation that we see in the media all the time. It's oppositional. It's not a wise discussion trying to get to the bottom line of some form of a, a resolution and some agreement about action uh, into the future that we might take. And, and therein lies the great challenge to how to change our thinking. It, it, in some ways, it very much ties into um, what Ken was talking about, good people working in large systems. Um, systems drive things. Culture drives things. My dear friend Alan Briskin is working on a book about fields and how sometimes people are not even doing their own thinking, but they're just a product of the, the, the field um, that we're in. Um, and so how do you do it? It's, it's one of the things that I've been kind of noodling with. And we have more, more solutions <laughs> than we could possibly look at. I mean, a lot of those have been raised here. You know, De Bono's thinking is a great, great, you know, is a, is a, is a great piece. Um, some of the other consultants that have, that have been talked about. Um, I saw uh, Barbenheimer last weekend. <laughs> <laughs> I had to go to both. And Which order? <laughs> I saw Barbie. I saw Barbie first. Okay. Okay. And the next night I saw, I had already gotten tickets to Oppenheimer. It was a last minute decision. And and one of the things that, that really struck me was the, the incredible, incredible power of the media. When you talk about creating, you know, levels of mass tra transformation, I mean, in some ways, you know, Barbie was a beautiful pink thing, but it wasn't a kid's movie because it really talked about, um, you know, the role models that we have been forced into. Um, and the idea in some ways, you know, Barbie being the metaphor of being dead and not kind of waking up as, as tears poured down <clears throat> the idea of dying, dying. But it was a beautiful picture in terms of transformative capacity in the message <clears throat> that it delivered. Um, and then Oppenheimer was just an, an incredible tour de force in terms of a movie um, and the messages that, that, that it delivered. You know, my favorite piece was the little dialogue between um, Oppenheimer and Einstein about whether or not that they've unleashed the, you know, the end of the world, uh, or the beginning of the end of the world. Um, so just some random musings. Um, I appreciate the tone and quality of the conversation. I think we actually are really listening to each other. So thank you. Maybe it's the 15 second rule that forces us to think what we just heard. Thank you for those musings. Um, I had a couple musings as well. And going back to Ken's incredibly good question, which is, you know, what do we do when the whole of society is drowning in disinformation? And whether it's climate change or politics or the future of technology, I, I, I've never, at least here in Washington, I, I've never been more dismayed and depressed about the quality of the information that is circulating. Uh, my old joke when I worked on the Hill was that you have some true geniuses, particularly in the Senate, who are able to juggle 50 issues at a time and operate in a world where one third of the data they get is actually right. 
one third of the data they get is half right. And one third of the data and suggestions is completely bogus. And there are 40,000 registered lobbyists whose job it is to provide all that bogus information and options. If I were saying that today, rather than in 1990, I think that the numbers would probably be 10% right, 10% half right, 80% totally bogus. And it, it, it's, it's I, I don't know how we deal with it. I, I've seen a lot of attempts on Twitter to correct Robert F. Kennedy Jr. But he's going on national cable news and being interviewed by the top journalists and just babbling. And whether it's COVID or NATO and Ukraine or uh, the state of the economy, I mean, he just is completely wrong, verifiably wrong, often three times in one sentence. I mean, it reminds me of Trump at his worst. And yet you can't correct it because every time you try to correct it, you repeat his fallacy. And some people think, OK, well, it must be a, a real opinion because people are engaging with him. The only thing I think might help is what I put in the chat. And that is that we have to somehow counteract the mass media and maybe maybe convince people to stop watching television and to start listening to their friends. Unfortunately, some of their friends are getting their information from mass media and Shane Hannity and, and the like, or from the worst kind of websites. But there is a an impact that comes from that that one on one. And I, I saw it with my my father, who's 88 now. I mean, he became a MAGA Republican rather than a a, a liberal Republican, which is what I was raised to be in Seattle in the you know, 50 years ago. And it was all because he would go to this breakfast meeting every week with his friends who were all watching Fox News and listening to Rush Limbaugh. And if you weren't listening to those sources, then you weren't cool, or at least you weren't engaged enough in the conversation. And the fact that all of these people who we had known for 40 years were sort of validating these strange ideas and total fabrications and lies gave him permission to believe this crap. And it, it became very sad. About 15 years ago, I just could no longer have a discussion about politics. And so we talked about sports or we talked about his career as an aeronautical engineer, um, talked about physics, but we couldn't talk about climate change, even though I worked for Al Gore for nine years on those issues. And have a PhD in earth science. You know, he he heard it from Rush Limbaugh that those scientists are just in it for the money, and that's all he needed to know. So I I, I hope somebody else has a better answer to this stuff. Uh, it's it's not information. It's not disinformation. It's not propaganda. Uh, this is cognitive warfare. This is about getting in the brains of people. And here at Carnegie, we have a whole team. It's not called propaganda and disinformation. It's called PCIO, Partnership for Counting, Countering Influence Operations. And we're focusing on the influence of opinion and the influence and damage to people's ability to think. And uh, uh, they, they are doing some of the best work I've seen by, by building a network of the best researchers trying to understand the impact of this stuff. Thank you. Can I just jump in for a quick second, Doug? Um, anybody here know what Rush Limbaugh's four pillars of uh, deception are? Rush Limbaugh's four pillars of deception is you can't trust anything that comes from the government, media, science, or universities. And he repeated that for 25 years. You can't trust government, media, science, or universities. And I think that's a, a huge part of why we have the challenge we have because there's so many people who believed him that if it's coming from any one of those sources, it's not valid, it's not believable, it's not it's not credible. And you said yes. all that from from a media platform, of course. Yes, because don't look at the man behind the curtain. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Just look at the big scary face. Mm -hmm.
Oh, okay. You put your, oh, you're muted, Doug. To uh, um, disconnect from the current tenor a little bit. Um, there was a documentary on Netflix that I saw recently called The Unknown Cave of Bones. And I don't know whether any of you have seen it, but it's a story of some archaeologists in Africa discovering a, a new uh, hominem species they called Homo naledi. And what they discovered in these series of caves, and I don't want to ruin the story, so I, I'm not going to tell you the details of the of the series of discoveries they made. But um, what they discovered in short was a species of our evolutionary uh, predecessors who were a hundred pounds and had brains the size of an orange, walked upright um, based on their skeletons were clearly uh, walkers, but also tree climbers. And they had enough intelligence and culture to bury their dead and to use tools and to create marks on, on, in stone in these caves on the walls. And they existed, give or take 250,000 years ago, well, well, well before Homo sapiens and Neanderthals. And they also had mastered the use of fire. All three of those things were things that the field of anthropology, of archaeology before these discoveries believed were impossible because only Homo sapiens um, exhibited that level of sophistication in terms of what's connoted by a, a group burying their dead. And, and I recommend it just because it was profoundly and emotionally affecting. It was not sensationalized or fictionalized. It was just laying out what they found, but it made these creatures 250,000 years ago relatable and not them mirroring us, but us descending from them. And The indigenous world today have a whole bunch of stuff over Western civilization in their knowing on a fully embodied basis, the nature of the reality and the world we live on and the interconnectedness of it all. And the emotional, water dimensions, the earth groundedness, energetic dimensions of existence of us as beings that are substantially missing from our civilized mm -hmm. developed capitalist world um, are extremely powerful in their effect on human beings. And Einstein, you know, said you can't fix what you're experiencing with the same thinking that created it. And I'm not sure that, that we can fix what ails us as a species with thinking. 
with solutions, with plans, with intellectual constructs. That's sort of what got us where we are. So the inquiry, at least for me, is not appealing to the intellectual body of eight and a half billion people, but um, perhaps turning attention to appealing to the sensing feeling bodies of eight and a half billion people. And figuring out how to shift out of fear as a sustained global psychosis and how to shift into needs and creating safety, which is a lot simpler in certain respects and more fundamental in all of our constructions. So with that, I'm complete. Thank you, Doug. I'm going to go back to what Mike was saying, but I will say that what I'm going to say does tie into what you're saying, because I do think to get into the sensing feeling, you first have to shift the thinking for, well, anyway, what I wanted to say, I wanted to get back to what Mike was saying, because I really have believed for a long time that the media is probably the most powerful leverage point that we have. And I wanted to tie it to my first statement where I was talking about us as individuals and the way we look at our peers' ideas. And I want to draw the next point, which is that the people in the media are individuals doing the same things. And I want to use an example that most of you have probably heard about. And it was a country star who, through cancel culture, has been elevated in the media to either a villain or a hero. So this person is making out because he's now ultra famous. The media is making out because whether you hate him or you love him, you're watching them speak about him. And I wonder what would have happened if this gentleman would have been called on to be interviewed without first attacking him to be interviewed from a true, not a gotcha kind of thing, but interviewed and said, were you aware that this video was taped outside the building? Do you know what happened there? How do you feel about that? Because we all know that people are very brave when they're on their keyboard, you know, or they're texting on Twitter or whatever, or when they have a crowd of adoring followers. But when you're looking in somebody's eyes, you kind of soften a bit. And I think that we want people to soften a bit. And if we just could remember that the energy we put out, the force that we put out, we're gonna be met with that same force. And maybe if we could dial it back, the same way you would try to get a two-year-old from not having a tantrum, you, you wouldn't keep like hammering. So again, I think that it would engage people. I think to hold somebody accountable, one second, Gil, to hold somebody accountable and really ask the question and give them the space to have to, to know that they're gonna be accountable to back up what they say might change the mindset of things and it might open the way to better conversations. So I'm complete, go ahead, Gil. I, I didn't wanna interrupt Stacey, I just wanted to get in queue behind you to comment. Thank you for what you just said. Um, there's there's an enormous power in actually being curious about other people and what they think and how they feel and why they say what they say. So I very much echo uh, what you're saying. And in relation to this recent phenomenon, I've noticed two things that are that I find really disturbing. One is that, man, so many people comment on headlines without reading the article. Uh, and I've raised that question. I, there's one one case on. I, I, I violated my protocol. I made a comment to a, I, about a, made a comment. I commented on something that a friend of a friend said, and I have a rule of not engaging with friends of friends if I don't know them. And I blew it there. And he he did this thing, and I 
said, I'm kind, I'm kind of fascinated at this phenomenon of people commenting on articles without reading the headlines. And he was pissed off at me for that. So there's that on the one hand. To this, to this song, I've been baffled. Uh, I have not seen the video. I've listened to the song, and for the life of me, I can't find what's offensive in the song. I understand the video has got other connotations to it. And I've and I've asked a few people in post to tell me what they are finding racist or horrible in the song. No one's answered. So it's an example of this kind of readiness. It's like flame on instantly before curiosity investigation um and you know again echoing stacy what you said i've been um i've been thing in my own conversations oops can you hear me my mic may have just shifted can you hear me yes um um everybody's got opinions right all the time we, we look just like uh, opinion creators and it's really easy to respond to somebody's opinion, well, like what you were saying with, yeah, but, no, you're wrong, I disagree, or, you know, subtext, you're an asshole, how can you even think that? Um, and it's really different to say, thank you for sharing your opinion with me, I'm curious what led you to that. You know, or my opinion is different, uh, this is interesting, we, you know, we're, we're both good folks, we both have different opinions about this thing, let's explore that. It's a very different kind of conversation than the immediate immediate lurch to fisticuffs and flame on and so forth so anyhow yeah thank you stacy for that i just have to jump in real quick because i i also just want to say the irony to that song is that what he's he's basically saying that if you do this that's what my gun is for so there is something to be you know it's <laughs> There is reason to be upset with the song and the video, but, and you should be just as upset when you hear a rap song, you know, denigrating women. You should just is be as upset with a lot of things. So again, I just don't want to make it like this guy is getting flack for nothing <laughs> because, you know, again, that's why I would love to have heard him have to stand up for what he's saying because I have to believe that there's good parts in him that wouldn't say that to somebody's face. Sorry, Doug, go ahead. You're muted. I'm going to come back to my opening comment before most of us were here, which is to say that with the increasing cascade of discussion about climate, more people are anxious and they're gonna use that anxiety to turn to the internet for up to the date news as to what's happening. And the result will be to create a huge platform of discussions uh, with all their conflicts that begin to replace the nation state as the platform for discussion. And it's creating a new culture that's going to be really interesting. End of thought. I see no hands up, so I want to see if anybody else has been as excited and fascinated by the Women's World Cup as I have been. It's even, I mean, you guys on the West Coast have a little bit of advantage in that some of the games that are at one o'clock or two o'clock here are at an almost reasonable time. But I, I, I'm always torn between thinking that the Super Bowl and the Olympics and the World Cup are the modern equivalent of 
bred in circuses in the late Roman Empire and thinking that they're a platform for incredible stories and celebration of people who have dedicated 10 or 20 years of their life to something to be the very best. Um, I, I lean dream during the periods when we're watching all of this, whether it's the Tour de France or the World Cup, I, I lean towards this is great, this is wonderful. And then in between, I read all the reports about the corruption and the doping by the Russians and think, oh, geez, we ruined a good thing. But uh, I, 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 I think there is something here. I, 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 I also think, unfortunately, that our, our politics have become some version of sports. And rather than just having an election that lasts six or eight weeks, like the Brits do, we've decided we need to spend a year and a half evaluating candidates and watching their gladiatorial combat on the de de debate stage. Um, and of course, spending literally billions of dollars on advertising, which of course feeds the media machine. But uh, any, anybody else who wants to be optimistic about sports or give other examples? Gil? You know, sports is really important um, at so many levels. I, I've been watching some of the Women's World Cup. There are games that are on earlier than that. Um, at least at least on our feed, there seem to be two a night and one is coming up at around 6 p.m. Pacific and then another like 10 p.m. Pacific. So you might you might be able to find an earlier one. Um, I'm enjoying it in part because I have no attachment uh, and I have no familiarity with the teams or the players. Uh, so I'm watching it for the pure joy of watching it to watch outstanding people perform outstandingly in teamwork. Um, and, you know, I sometimes root for one team or another, but mostly I just love watching the play uh, yeah. of it. And, um, um, you know, and for me, the same, when I watch the Olympics, I don't really care that I'm, like the coverage has evolved over the last, I don't know, 30 years or so to be about the games as a whole, to be about, to being about the U.S. team. Mm -hmm. I imagine it's similar in other countries. And I want to watch just seeing the best of humans, uh, people who have dedicated their lives to, to excelling, uh, sometimes individually, sometimes together, mm -hmm. um, and just marvel at what's possible for us to do uh, as outside of the nationalism thing. So there's that. Um, uh, a really interesting watch on, I think it's on Apple TV is a show is a four part documentary called super league. Um, oh yes. Fight for football or something like that. It's about the attempt to, to corporatize the game of football yeah, yeah. Soccer here in the United States yeah. the world. It's fascinating, um, in itself, it's fascinating how they were able to make this thing, uh, how they were able to produce this film in the course of the drama. Um, and uh, one of the themes in it is, uh, in the fight for football, is the fans rising up and saying, we do not want you fuckers to corporatize our game because this is ours. And this is, a, you know, this is a passion rooted in community. And it's, anyhow, I'll leave it to you to see it. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful piece of work. I, I just want to right. reinforce that jingoism sells. Yeah. And the second thing is if, if people have not watched any of it, if you can watch a replay of this morning's game between Australia and Nigeria, it was just a, a an amazing game. Mm. And, and the women are better at teamwork and the women don't do all these acting, the flopping where, you know, you pretend you were pushed yeah. over and you roll yeah, on the they ground. Do, and they do paint. a little of it, but they get up real fast. They don't, they don't ride. <laughs> you know, there may be, there may be something about teamwork and women and um, you know, one of the things I love about watching the Golden State Warriors play basketball is the and, and this was this was there in the early Brazilian soccer team when Pele was playing, is a magical kind of teamwork that's almost telepathic and balletic. Um, and for you know, for me, it's just a joy to see to see just to watch it itself and also to see that potential of human beings. So, uh, Carl, I'm going to just jump in quickly. I just forgot to raise my hand when I thought we weren't. Um, it, it's it's the um, the power and passion of presence that these athletes bring to the game. It's extremely just um, beautiful to watch 
you know, the unfortunate pieces we've, you know, kind of devolved where people think, you know, most important is who's winning and who's losing. <laughs> and I remember the, you know, <laughs> some of those old paradigms that they used to try to, you know, teach kids. It's not a, it's not so much about who wins or loses. It's about how to play the game. And yet we've devolved to where crazy parents are ending up in jail about with assaults and things like that, about their kid not being in the game, you know? And look what we, we, we do as human beings. There's also a new documentary about... Um, Stephen Curry, I think it's on yes. Apple, Apple Apple TV about, you know, how he rose up from being told, ah, you're too small, you're too little, blah, 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 and pushed back against all that um, adversity as a motivator, which is, you know, a great media lesson. Mm -hmm. I can interrupt before Carl talks. My dad was a little league coach, and he was also the commissioner of the local church softball league. The church players were far more misbehaved. More they misbehaved even worse than <laughs> little league parents. Carl, yeah. To, well, to Gil's point, uh, um, the Steve Kerr the coach and his father was the president of the American University and was assassinated yep. and stuff. There's been some interviews with him. Uh -huh. And then there was an award, one of the sports award shows, but they were, it was all focused on the first responders in Cincinnati and all the good stuff that's, so there's, and then I guess to Stuart's point, um, there's also the, I mean, it's the preparation to aspect of, you know, that you're really an expert in something. And I mean, you got the passion, um, they were just talking about the um, commander's new quarterback and how he's been saying an hour, an hour and a half later, and he's won the locker room. So, you know, don't care about what people are saying outside the locker room. And EA Sports rated him as a 66, which is like the lowest of any starting quarterback or whatever. But uh, just some various points. But yeah, sports has a lot. Um, a lot of power there. So does music, so does food. I mean, there's a lot of things that are kind of cross-cultural. I want to put a plug in for a documentary that's 10 years old, has nothing to do with sports, but it's called Particle Fever. And if you want to see collaboration at the highest levels in the world, these are the people who built the Large Hadron Collider. They come from all over the world. They are incredibly brilliant, and it's a very inspiring movie. Um, you know, right now, it's I don't know if she's still the head of it, but there's a a woman leading this who um, is a classically trained pianist and a and a and an off the charts physicist. And you know, they get together and solve really hard problems, and they do it, you know, in with grace and and kindness and compassion and curiosity and it's like everything about this movie i found inspiring so um i just throw it in the in the uh, chat there wikipedia uh particle fever get a chance if you have a chance to watch that it's really enjoyable she is amazing we gave her the award for uh, uh innovation at the arthur c clark foundation three years ago Ooh. and um that she's she's just incredible fabriola Ginotti. yeah and she just did an interview with yo-yo ma mm -hmm. the two of them in discussion mm -hmm. i'll see if i can find it so so what if this is normal for human beings what if this kind of collaboration across you know across nationalities across differences what if this is normal what if people coming together to do remarkable things is normal what if this is what we do? What if, and, I, and I'll assert this is true, what if there are millions upon millions of examples right now of people doing stuff like this at big scale and small scale? And it's not what makes the news because it's not, it bleeds, it leads. And it's not a fire on the front page. And, you know, Paul Hawkins book some years ago, Blessed Unrest, chronicled millions of grassroots organizations working on climate injustice and environmental issues. If you saw the film of that, there's at the end, there's a credit scroll of groups and the credit scroll goes on for like five minutes. So, you know, 
And so that's a story in the world of now, as well as the class eight gun and the creeping fascism and everything else. It's not what shows up in the media that Rush Limbaugh uses the media to tell us to not to trust, but there it is. Um, uh, you know, Eleanor LeCain used to run a thing for years called What's Working, which featured, it was all about inspirational stories of regular human beings, sometimes against enormous odds, sometimes not doing stuff together. And, um, um, you know, so where do I wanna go with this? Sometimes we argue and sometimes we fight and sometimes we invite and sometimes we inspire. And, you know, and, and maybe, and sometimes plans are important and sometimes poetry is important. Uh, you know, and the, the question that's been, that's been in the background for me in this whole conversation is how do we shift the background? You know, so a couple of people have referred to it. Stuart, Stuart, I think you talked about the field that somebody referenced and it reminded me of Heidegger's clearing of like, you know, the background in which everything shows up. And, you know, it's like not that it's not that I'm thinking thoughts. It's that thoughts are arising in me out of the context of this conversation and my history and the culture that I'm living in. Um, yeah, you can maybe persuade me to do something different by logic and argument, but maybe that's not how change actually happens. So the mystery for me is how does it happen? How does the field shift? How does the clearing shift? We know that it can because we know that it has. You know, we've seen in our lives, we've seen social norms change in this country and in other countries. Uh, we've seen pushback against social norms changing. You know, we're in a, we're in a, we're in a battle for the story of the world, for what's real and what matters. And so for me, the mystery is how, you know, how do we as heartful, thoughtful, compassionate, creative people contribute to that in the best ways we can uh, in the face of all that's swirling around us. Uh, Ken and I, um, in the in the living between worlds called Dave. Gil, we right. lost you. Your your audio dropped out. Is anyone else hearing Gil? No. Gil, your audio is gone. Right after living okay. between worlds. Maybe he can't hear us either. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to briefly, um, <clears throat> until Gil comes back, comment on what um, Doug said earlier, Doug Carmichael, about um, internet conversations of a positive nature kind of taking over governance. Um, and I just... Um, Yes, and how to get these conversations into the public realm and how to get, you know, more and more people um, listening. I remember when when the Internet first arrived, you know, the aspiration or goal was to, you know, have something go viral. <laughs> I haven't heard that term in a long time because there's just so much out there right now. And I just wanted to, you know, kind of uh, punctuate that 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 thought. Mm -hmm. I do have a poem. We're at time. Um, this is Maya Angelou. On a bright day next week, on a bright day next week, just before the bomb falls, just before the world ends, just before I die, all my tears will powder black in dust like ashes, black like Buddha's belly, black and hot and dry. Then will mercy tumble, falling down in godheads, falling on the children, falling from the sky. Thanks, Ken. <laughs> Great way to end the call. <laughs> Ken, give us the link if you can. Say that again. Could you, could you give us the link? 
uh it's i don't have a link it's actually from a book of poems of hers but um, give it the title. It's, it's called on a bright day next week you can probably google it and find it that's my angelou thank you well after this conversation and everything else in the news i'm going to go see the barbie movie <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah. propaganda. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Mm -hmm. Bye. Did anybody capture the chat? Is there any way to do that? Three yeah. dots. Uh, you can you can save it, and it'll, no, it'll I be couldn't. saved. The three dots down at the very bottom. Oh uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, I was able to. Okay. Usually, um, I do. Somehow, it wasn't coming up before. And I'll send uh, the recording and the chat and everything to Jerry. So. Um, and let him publish. He'll be impressed his, with how well we managed channel. without him. <laughs> <laughs> maybe he'll uh, maybe he'll let us do it always. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> I hope not too. Bye. Cheers, all. Yeah.